you sign exclusively worldwide to somebody here in the US, what do they know about how things actually work in Europe or in Japan or in Korea? Maybe they're like me and work with a lot of international and happen to know how it works, but chances are they're focused on their market. So when you're doing deals, if you do non-exclusives, you're able to harness the strategic power of people in different markets, yep. in different sectors, and use that to your advantage. So that's awesome. This that's how all, it breaks down. This is all gold, man. This is gold right here coming from Mark. So you know, I have been on a real tear on this channel to talk about other ways to get into sync licensing, not just talking about music libraries, but also talking about things like sync agents and direct sync. Well, if you saw last week's video, if you haven't seen that, it'll be here and it'll be at the end of the video and it'll be down below as well. We had an interview with Tamara Bubble and she just blew out the room and blew everyone's minds. So you need to watch that video. But today's video is going to even more blow your mind because today I'm going to talk to an absolute pro sync agent. This is all this person does. He is not an artist. He is not a composer. He is someone who has been in this business for years. He focuses on it and you've probably seen his sync summit and other videos and his name is Mark Freezer. And so I am so excited for this. Mark has a wealth of experience. He tells it like it is and you are going to hear some things that you have not heard before from someone talking about sync licensing. Are you ready? I don't think you're ready for this. I don't think they're ready. You know, we talk about a lot of income streams on this channel and sync licensing is just one of them and that's why we have a free ebook for you called 50 ways to make music income and yeah sync licensing is one of those music licensing stock licensing it's all part of that but there's also 50 other ways you could make music income and i want to make sure you get this for free it's my free gift to you you can have it anytime you want just go to makemusicincome.com 50 ways so now let's talk about sync agents and get into the interview with mark it's a little long i'll warn you so there are timestamps below if you just want to go to certain places, but I would recommend soaking in this whole interview and making sure you get all the knowledge that he is presenting to us because this kind of information isn't just floating around the internet all the time about sync agents and the inside life of a sync agent. So you're going to want to watch the whole thing. Here's our interview. Well, I am so happy to be here with Mark Freezer from Sync Summit. You guys know him from Sync Summit and all the great things that they do there. And also from his very own sync agency, Disconic. We're going to talk about both of those today. Mark, thanks so much for being here and joining me. It's, it's just a pleasure to talk to you after like being involved in so many of your events and, and of your uh, Facebook group things and all that kind of stuff. You give so much and I feel like I know you already just by sitting and being part of those kind of things. Thanks so much for being here today. Oh, absolutely, Eric. It's my pleasure, you know, and uh, I've been admiring the work that you've been doing for the community. And uh, I think you've been doing some great interviews and some great discussions, uh, just in general, illuminating uh, how the music business works and, you know, what some of the challenges and opportunities are and ways that you can work through both of those uh, to monetize um, your artistry. So, Thanks for having me here. I hope that I can add to that illumination. Well, I, I think you certainly will, because I don't know of anybody I have researched uh, really that that is in the sync agent education space as much as you are. And, uh, and so it's always been a, a goal of mine to have you on the channel. But let me get started with the first question that I ask everybody on this channel. And it's just kind of what we do here. And I, how do you make music income? How do I make music income? Well, you know, um, the way that I make music income is that uh, I act as a problem solver for people that are looking to license or to create music for visual, interactive, or let's say advertising or branded media. And um, the way that uh, I do that is by working on behalf of my clients who are primarily labels, publishers, artists, and management companies who own music. And I work as their advocate 
to connect their music to opportunities in television shows, in films, games, other interactive platforms, in advertising, directly with brands, and on social media. Excellent. So that's the typical way that a sync agent generates income. Right. As far as my own music goes, I'm sort of a dormant singer. I used to, <laughs> uh, I used to have a, a swing band in the '90s, nice. and um, we had some fun with that. But then I went into the tech business, so uh, I just made a decision that I would go into that. And I still do things in tech, but really, primarily, you know, the way that I make. Um, income from music is by helping other people to make income through music. And the last thing I can put on that is, of course, with Sync Summit, we're an event and online educational and in-person educational company. And um, through our events and our courses, mm -hmm. a lot of them are free, but some of them are uh, not free. Right. So we make, uh, we make some income that way through music. But most of our direct income through music is working as an advocate for our clients. So through Disconic mainly it would be? Would yes, be? exactly. Okay, great. And you already answered the question, are you a musician yourself? Good to know about that. So how did you get mm -hmm. into all of the music licensing stuff if you were an artist at one point? I know I have my story. Everybody has their story about how they got into it. And actually, this is a whole kind of course I want to do about all the people. I've got a book called Getting Into Sync that I kind of talk about my journey into it. But everybody right. has their unique way they kind of found out and got into licensing music. How, how did you get into this whole business? Okay, I, it's it's really interesting you bring this up because for me, you know, I have uh, I have like I said a background in tech and fairly corporate background in some ways, and uh, I had a company in the mobile music space. We created mobile content. This is in the uh, aughts, so from like two thousand to two thousand six. Mm -hmm. Without getting into the details of that company too much, I had uh, worked with a lot of people, a lot of people who uh, have you know, what they call bold face names, famous people. Mm -hmm. One of the people that ended up becoming a friend of mine over the years was Beyonce's dad and former manager, Matthew Knowles. So I'd say it was about in 2006, he and I are having one of our, I'd say monthly chats. And he's telling me about this deal that he did that was with Samsung. And it involved Beyonce being in an ad and a, having a Beyonce phone and having all this Beyonce content and fan clubs and stuff inside of the phone. Wow. And alongside that was this, uh, this, this ad campaign worth hundreds of millions of dollars that she was inside of. And when we started talking about this, he said, Mark, you know, the deal in itself is great, but what's really excellent is that the ad campaign is starting right before we have an album coming out and we're getting this enormous lift for the new album yeah. from this uh, ad campaign that Samsung is doing. So when I heard that, that put the sort of um, seed in my head that lay dormant for a number of years mm -hmm. uh, until uh, 2000, I want to say 2011. So for about five years, it sort of was dormant there while I was working, uh, heading up marketing at a uh, telecom. I was getting a little tired of doing that and I thought, hey, you know, I really want to get into this music licensing thing. I want to get into connecting artists and their music with opportunities in the world of advertising. That's really where I started out. And did that out. come from the Beyonce idea thing? That yeah, you that saw? came from that idea. Mm -hmm. nice. Exactly. And then I thought, but you know what? I know that it works in television, in film, in games, whatever. So I did a little bit of networking. I met a music supervisor and that music supervisor became my sensei in the beginning, learning about how this business actually worked, yeah. who the players were. And then after that, you know, I just really realized this was an opportunity for every musician, for anyone who makes music or owns music to do the same thing on a smaller level that somebody who's a really big artist does, yeah. which is use music licensing and music creation for visual media to act as a sort of a fulcrum to generate revenue from those syncs themselves, but also 
potentially create new opportunities to build audience and to build sales. Because yeah, yeah. if you get a piece of music, and I've seen it many times when I've worked with my clients and seen it with other people, when you get a piece of music in a TV show that's popular or in an ad, uh, that doesn't just translate to money. It also translates to exposure yes. and exposure translates to sales, sales of live, um, of live tickets, um, streams, of course. you know, for the amount of money that that's worth, right? Not much, but it's there. Yeah. But um, if a million also, people are watching Grey's Anatomy and you have a song on there and they're like, uh, shazamming that thing and then going there exactly. could change the game. Exactly. And, you know, you look at this and it, it, act, it can act for people as a real building block in terms of all the ways that you make money as a musician. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why I think, you know, sync and creation of music for licensing is a very important component of everything that a musician does because it goes right alongside in terms of promotion and revenue, live, streaming, Absolutely. merchandise, they all and go together. everything else that you do. That's why I try to yeah. tell everybody, all of the streams, they all go together. Royalties, artist side, licensing side, um, yep. all of it, 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 it all goes together and you need, people say, which one should I do? I'm like, all of them. I mean, <laughs> you really yeah. need to be doing all of it. And so, uh, yeah, because a, a, it's the hardest thing to talk composers and people into licensing who are just into licensing. That's their main thought into the Spotify side. I'm like, why aren't you putting your stuff also on Spotify and being artists? Well, I just like to make this stuff and hopefully, and I think everybody gets this tunnel vision sometimes. I'm just going to be an artist and try to get on Spotify and what can I do to get on, on the playlist? And they just have this like thing where they could also be doing licensing and, and both could feed each other. So that's great stuff. And speaking Absolutely. of that, do you find yourself working mostly with artists? Uh, you, you mentioned the word music owner and I've heard uh, other people talk about music buyers or different things. Would you find yourself working more with primarily with music artists themselves? Is that who your main client you know, is? If I look at everybody that I work with, you know, I have, I, I basically, I have two distinct types of um, people that I work with. The majority of the music that I represent, I would say about 65% of it is labels, publishers, and management companies. Oh, okay. So that's that's sort of a more sort of like corporate area, and I'll talk about how that works. The rest of it is artists, and I work with hundreds of artists. But sure. I have to say, the way that the way that my agency is structured, we represent some of the biggest labels in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, in in Korea, in Taiwan, in Japan, in India, in um, Europe, and uh, in South America. Because those, those are those the, are the bigger markets. deals, right? Those are the bigger yeah. deals. And some of the some of the companies that are clients of ours, they they probably have, uh, I would say, you know, a million songs. You know, some of the bigger ones. <laughs> We don't we don't work with those million songs. We work with a teeny teeny bit that we've selected, but you know we work with a lot of content like that. But at the same time, you know I have been an advocate for artists and what we do from the beginning, yep. and I have seen artists, big and small, not getting their fair share of stink revenue mm -hmm. and not knowing how to navigate this business. So you know what I try to do when I work with an individual artist, no matter who they are, is to say, okay, you have a certain amount of music that you've created. You're creating a certain amount of music now. And you have this sort of sound and this sort of feel. Where can we take this in the sync community? Is it something that's gonna work more for television and film? Is it something that's gonna work more for advertising? Is it gonna work across the board? We make that assessment. And then we do a couple of things when we're working with artists. Uh, we will proactively present the music. I, I don't like using the word pitch, but basically pitching mm -hmm. uh, the music to people in our network, letting them know that it's there. And then um, 
when they come to us asking for specific music for opportunities, we make an assessment of the music that we have available, and then we'll present them with playlists that they can evaluate. Gotcha. And then if something hits, uh, then basically we'll have a conversation with our client. We'll tell them this is what's going on and we'll advise them whether or not we think that this is a deal that they should move forward on, explain the reasons why, do the paperwork, get everybody paid and go on to the next. Your priorities are music buyers who are right. music supervisors for film and television. I would say, and then mm -hmm. advertising companies that need music for things. And you and who are your music buyers? Certainly music supervisors, but who else? Okay, it's a good question because basically when you're looking at uh, television and film, it's a pretty simple process. It's usually the music supervisor mm -hmm. and the um, showrunner who's effectively the director and writer in right. television. Yeah. And uh, in uh, film, it's the music supervisor and director. Right. And those are the typical like first line people that we will uh, work with on music. Okay. There's also music coordinators who work alongside the music supervisors. And they're super important because those people are the music supervisors of tomorrow. And if you help them out now, they're yeah. going to help you out later. So there's a tip for you. But outside of that, in games, there are music supervisors. There mm -hmm. are developers mm -hmm. of the uh, games themselves. Those are people that you work with advertising and it's like I do an advertising course because advertising is so right, different right. and advertising there about half to 60% of the time there are no music supervisors making the music yeah. decisions so you'll have the decisions made directly by a number of people it could be the editor of the commercial after everything's been done it could be the creative director right. or the chief creative director who is Sort of like the showrunner in television. Sure, They're sure. in charge of the overall production. Yep. Uh, that person could be making direct decisions. Mm -hmm. It could be the um, director, though a lot of the time it's not. It could yeah. be the director of the, uh, of the, of the um, commercial. Or a lot of the time it can also be the people directly at the brand. Some of the brands have dedicated music people like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and not a lot of others, though I think they all should, um, they have dedicated people in-house. Apple certainly has like a whole organization yeah. for it. And when you're looking at advertising and when you're looking at brands, you have to say, okay, is there somebody who's a music producer in the music department at the agency or at the brand? Well, a lot of the time there isn't. So where do I go? Mm -hmm. Those two people that I talked about, number one, the creative uh, person, the mm -hmm. creative directors, and the other persons are the editors. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that you go to. Gotcha. So at the, end, at the end of the day, on the buy side, those are the people from a day-to-day -day basis that I deal with. So, okay, uh, we've got the music funnel from the music um, out of uh, the music owners that you are, are working right. with, right? And you're trying, you're getting them to the music buyers. So it, it can't be a, like you just hear every song and you go, Oh, it's good for this guy, it's good for that guy. Do you have a, a process of getting it? I mean, do you have just like a mega email list and or whatever that you just say, Okay, everybody, here's the newest stuff I have now. Who's interested? I mean, I, is that a, a generalization of what you do? It's a generalization, and I think it's valid, but the particulars are a little, you know, a little different. Basically, you know, I've built up a network over time. Of course. So I know many, many music supervisors, mm -hmm. and a lot of them come to me with specific requests. Right. You get briefs. So that's one. I get a lot of requests. Okay. They're not briefs most of the time. Oh, and this okay. is a reality I want to give people is yeah. that by the time – a request becomes a brief, it's gone out to a lot of people. Oh, I see. So the chances of the deal actually going through for one person, it's it's not impossible, but it's more like a scratch ticket than it is like having <laughs> a direct relationship where somebody will send me a DM and go, hey, Mark, I'm in a bind. I need a replacement track yeah. for this. It's 30 seconds. I've got this much money. Can you help me? Yeah. And then in that situation, that's that's only built over time. 
And it's you not know, a pitch. It's, a, have, it's not a pitch. It's a catch. Is uh, Tamara? It's a catch, say. right? <laughs> and then you look at that and you're like, okay, I have something for you. And usually, if I don't, I know somebody who does. Yeah. So I'll be like, get in touch with my friend, or like I had somebody ask me for something from a label that I don't represent, and I said, here's the label contact. Get in touch with them directly. So that's one thing. On the other side, to to your main question. I have a big list of a few thousand people, music supervisors, coordinators, people at ad agencies. I will send out to those people on a weekly or fortnightly, every two weeks basis, um, sort of an informal newsletter. And it'll spotlight different artists that I work with, Mm -hmm. different kinds of music. And when I do that, usually what I do is I make it half individual artists that I work with. And the other half is more like, here's some stuff from company X or company Y and give them an idea of some of the newer stuff or some of the stuff that they may not have heard that could be interesting for their projects. And, you know, we also have a big social media presence. So we put it out there as well, but primarily You know, we have these relationships with these different companies and people, and we um, create awareness through um, primarily newsletters and 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 targeted emails. That's That's primarily it. Because I just I think of the sync agent as this person in an impossible situation between millions of songs and thousands of possibilities or hundreds of possibilities or whatever you want to say. And, and it's coming down through this tiny funnel of one. I don't know how many people are in your, do you run this with a small group or do you run this alone or do you run this with? I have, I have two other people that work with me on the sync side. I have more people that work with me on the sync summit side, because honestly it's a bit labor intensive in comparison to licensing, right? Because we actually have to like go through a lot of constant back and forth with people. But on the licensing side, you know, we have to do marketing and outreach and then we have to do execution of contract and delivery. So, you know, you can do that. Uh, a lot of that's automated, fortunately, these days and electronic in nature. So, you know, we have some efficiencies there. It's still but, surprising um, to me how how small most sync companies are, whether they're libraries or agencies or whatever. I mean, you're not dealing with a company of 100 it, you would think you no. would with that many songs, but you're dealing more, more, more like a, a, a person like yourself who is like, I've been in this industry. I know the people I have the, and it's because of relationship because not all 100 people that sure. could be in a company could have the same relationships that you have with all these people because you've cultivated them. So, and, and the other thing that I can say, and I think that this is, this is important for everybody is that you only really are able to uh, build a successful practice in sync over time. There's no magic bullet that's right. going to get you there, you know, in like three months yeah. or six months. Right. Right. And I say this, I say this as somebody who's had some time in this industry and it's taken a number of years to get to the point where it's like every day we have something coming in and yep. we're putting something out, yep. you know, and, you can't expect to go from zero to a hundred because people have to get to know you. And you also have to make sure that your music is getting, is made aware to a critical mass of people. And the only thing that's going to allow you to do that is time. And as an agent, you know, the thing that I say to people, no matter who you are, if you want to be your own agent or you want to work with other agents is that, You see yourself as an advocate uh, for your music and you see yourself as a problem solver for the people that will potentially license your music or commission you to create music. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, as a creator, your music is amazing and you are unique and you're authentic. And that's the biggest thing that you have going for you. And you have to be an advocate for that in every way in getting it out to the world. But on the other side, you have to realize that the people that you're reaching out to, 
uh, are basically businesses. Yeah. Like music supervisors are businesses. Yeah. They might think your music's really cool and they might like you personally. And that counts for something small. Mm -hmm. But what we are looking for is we're looking for music that helps us to tell a story in television and film, helps to create more excitement in the interactivity for interactive platforms, and helps us to sell a product in ads or with brands. Mm -hmm. That's our goal. And that that's the first goal. The second goal, which is equally as important, is that we are able to find the music and we are able to execute on licensing the music or right. execute on working with you. And that second part is where a lot of people sort of fall short, mm -hmm. you know, and it comes to a lot of different things. If you have bad metadata, mm -hmm. when we get your music, we're going to, that's a red, that's a, it's a sort of a red flag. Mm -hmm. We're going to say, uh, how can we, how can we get in touch with this person? There's no information there or there's no descriptive tag. So it makes it hard for us to find it. Basically what happens is if you have bad metadata, um, we're going to move on because we don't have time. Is that a daily when we're problem? Licensing you? music. Is that a daily problem? It's a, it's a daily problem. It's a constant problem that we deal with. It's is bad metadata. After all Another the one, videos out there about metadata and all the information, if they, oh, yeah. if you're not on metadata, you're not you haven't been studying enough or watching this, researching this enough. Exactly. And I'm going to do something for everybody here. I got so frustrated with it. One of the things that I did is I created a freestyle guide for everybody, and I'm yeah. going to give you a link okay. in the chat. I'll put uh, it chat. in the description. If yeah. you want to, yeah, go ahead and put it in the description. It's completely free for everybody. Cool. Sort of my public service for everyone. And I guarantee you, if you use what's in this guide and you do it, your metadata will be straight. And that's yeah. super important. But there's also other things that are really important. Like, do you know who all your writers are? Have you done a split sheet that you feel confident about if you're if you're a writer? Mm -hmm. um, and can you execute on an agreement? Can you go through the process of signing an agreement with us? Yeah. You know, and 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 all of these things you need to be able to do them because if we can't license your music from a business level. We can't do business with you, and we can't pay you. Well, let's let's and, let's move to that artist side now. We've kind of been been heading towards it. I mean, I, I assume yep. that you won't work with a company, a, a label, or a publisher unless they come in with metadata set. You you say, okay, we'll work with you, but or do you do you fight it there as well? <laughs> it's even worse. Oh my gosh! It's even worse. <laughs> it's even worse. I'll tell you. It's like I work with companies all over the world, and their metadata is mostly horrible. Wow. You know, that's why it's like. I, I'm saying I'm working, uh, I'm still doing work in tech. I'm working on a tech solution for metadata with a friend of mine who built the back end of Spotify. So, you know, stay tuned for that yeah. because I think that's the only way we're going to fix it. When you go to the major labels, I'm not going to get into this too much, but when you get music from them nine times out of 10, there's no metadata there beyond the artist and the title and maybe the publisher. So, mm -hmm. What we end up having to do is we end up having to say to them, look, we're going to have to fill in your metadata for you if you don't do it yourself. <laughs> and then we don't do that for free because yeah. that's not being, that's not, that's not being a sync agent. That's right. being something else. Yeah. So we say, okay, we'll fill this in for you because we need to. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a problem everywhere. Yeah. And artists, you know, you need to be able to figure out how to fill in your metadata, not just because we want it for sync, okay. but also because search engines, AI, everywhere else, they demand it. And the better your metadata is, the better your music will be found and the better um, 
the easier we'll be able to pay you. Okay. That's I don't right. want to get into the metadata. Oh, that's great. No, so no not only that, but we've got the metadata thing. I'm going to put it in the description so everybody can go down there and look at that metadata information from Sync Summit and get clear on that. That that's you, you, Cool. You, your responsibility as a viewer here is to go down there in that description box and look at the metadata stuff because if you're interested in this whole business, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about music libraries or music supervisors or, or, or sync yeah. agents or direct pitching, whatever you're doing, you better have your metadata. And speaking of direct pitching, we both know Tamara Bubble, and she is a force all unto her own. And we just did a recent video right before you, mm -hmm. so they're going to kind of come out as bookends. But uh, we did awesome. a music libraries versus direct sync video, and I was, t you know, giving the pluses and minuses of of, of, of music libraries because that's mainly who I've worked with. And then she was just talking about, well, then you're stupid if you're do not doing direct sync because direct sync really is the only way to go and basically that libraries are trash and, and and sync is best done directly and i think you probably fall probably more on the direct side because that's what you do would you what are your thoughts well you know i'm gonna put on my music supervisor hat now okay because i always, right. i Good. also work as a music supervisor and i'm gonna take i'm gonna basically when i do that what it means is i'm zooming out right. okay mm -hmm. i'm not looking at it as a sync agent okay as a music supervisor and somebody who has worked primarily with ads, I want music from wherever the best source is. Uh, okay. Okay. And what that means on a practical basis is sometimes that best source is going to be a composer mm -hmm. that I work with mm -hmm. and I get, and I'm going to create a bespoke piece of music. Right. And maybe we'll bring in different artists, different composers to co to co develop it with us, depending on the project. So that's one scenario. The other scenario is okay. We're going to license a piece of music. We've got this much budget. We're going to work directly with a with a sync agency, or we're going to work directly with an artist who has their own catalog or we're going to work with a label or a publisher right. because we know what we want. Basically we've got this budget and we're going to bring that opportunity to the person or company that we designate. Sure. And that's really cool when you can do that for the artist because you know, I yeah. love seeing artists getting paid. Right. So that's n number two. The third scenario is, well, look, um, I was hired to help produce this commercial. We've got, we really haven't thought about the music yet. I've been in this scenario where I've produced a commercial and we've done all of the video, all the storyboarding, all the writing. We've had the actors come in. We're in the middle of finalizing all of that. We're about to go to the editing bay and the editor's like, Hey, we need some music. What do you got? And we're like, <laughs> um, we should have thought about that. And um, this happens a lot in ads, yeah. but uh, it happens in other areas too, where we're like, well, what are we going to do? Um, how much money do we have left? Oh, we've got like 500 bucks, a yeah. thousand bucks. Well, we can't really hire somebody or license music for that much. Yeah. Uh, let's go and find a music library mm -hmm. and see what we can get there. So we'll pick something out. And, the reason I gave you these scenarios is first, that's how it works in the real world. You is think that, that's their checklist? You, know, you assess these things. Yeah. yeah, you assess these ways of getting music. And all of these ways of getting music are opportunities for an artist to have their music monetized. Sure. I know people who work for music libraries all day and make a living creating oh, custom music for them. Yeah. And, and they do okay. You know, but if you want to do that, that's a full time job. Yeah. So, and, and the people know. who I know who make six figures or beyond on that, they have 2000 songs in libraries, 2000. Exactly. You know, not just right. like versus if you do, uh, you could probably do 10% of that in direct deals and make the same if you really uh, had a great, had great uh, communications and or a great. Without a doubt. Whatever. So, and that's, I couldn't agree with you. I, I couldn't agree with you more on that, Eric, because you know, if you want to dedicate yourself to working just with music libraries and put in the time and effort to do it, you can make a good living. Yeah. With that said, most artists don't want to do that. Right. Most artists want to be artists, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 
how are you going to monetize your 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 music for sync if you want to be an artist who's touring who's producing who's doing sure. outreach with fans and everything else that you do as an artist that's where music licensing or working directly or working with a sync agent comes in the other thing is is that on a per item basis Working with a sync agent probably will make you a lot more money on a per license basis of course. than oh, yeah. a music library. Because yeah. music libraries, like, not really very many upfront fees. They do happen, mm -hmm. but when they do, they're usually not more than $1,000. And they're not very upfront. You know, no. <laughs> I get sync payments about six months after the song goes in the library because that's an up, quote unquote, upfront. But the the sync doesn't happen for a while, and then so that upfront doesn't pay for right. a while. So, yeah, it can be it can be frustrating. And look, we go through that on the sync license sync licensing side too, because sometimes we get paid in a month, other times we get paid in 120 days. It depends Welcome on to the, the music studio. Business. You know, and we just have to we just have to build that into what we do. But the thing that's great for artists in working in licensing their existing music is that you're not going to have too many micro syncs where it's like a little tiny bit of money usually. Yeah. And it can be life changing if you have your music in an ad. Yeah or you have your music used in a major portion of a show or in a film, you know, I've network I've had. Yeah, exactly. And I've had music where, you know, it, it has been quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of, uh, not just money, but quite a lot of, uh, promotion for the artist as a result of the sync. And those sorts of things never happen working with libraries. Yeah. You're not going to get, you're not going to have uh, the kind of money or the kind of publicity from that. So in that sense, I agree with Tamara on that, mm -hmm. but I'm going to always look at it from the top level view. Yeah. You should also say, you know what? I'm going to play all three of these. And I have people who are in my classes and in the, our community that do all three, yeah. where they work with a couple of production houses who mm -hmm. ask them to produce me certain kinds of music and right. they create some instrumentals mm -hmm. and some music beds and put it out there and then make what they make. Then they have a block of stuff that they've made with vocalists that's well produced, that's yeah. really great quality, and they put that out directly or through sync agencies. Okay. And then they have some stuff that they do directly as composers with brands, with game companies mm -hmm. as requested. Yeah, That's really, I think, if you're going to look at this industry strategically, what you need to do. Yeah, you need to do all three. Yeah, probably. Yeah, if you can, and 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 it's tough if because you can. if you're if you're if you're trying to play the library game, like we said, it's going to take two two thousand songs. If you're trying to play the artist game, you're busy enough being an artist. If you're a good artist, that licensing is a whole extra thing you have to do on top of everything yeah. else you have to do as an artist. And then the other the other one where you're doing direct deals with companies with with music buyers, you have to make all those relationships. You have to go hustle all those deals yourself and become the person yep. that that knows them. You have to have your own database and email list like you do and, and, and basically do what you've done over the all these years is just build all it those takes relationships. Time. Yeah. So and, and yeah. all of it takes time. Uh I, I just did a like podcast with my uh podcast partner uh, Stevie and we were talking about the fastest way and of course the fastest way to licensing income is a direct deal with that because you made it yourself with a company and they pay you a thing like like any client uh, I could like if even if I produce a client and they say I want you to produce a song for me I was like thousand dollars <laughs> and they they yeah. send it that day because it's it's they're they're paying for a product same as if I went to an ad agency they said oh yeah we've heard that stuff we want you to do something for us I'd say ten thousand dollars and and you know you get paid right away right. that's the fastest way but you got to have those those you got to have that lead you got to have that relationship with that person in order to get that so now in a sync agent deal we should just make uh, this clear from what I understand usually the artist keeps all the publishing they keep their writer side and their publishing side yeah and, and then you are paid out of the the sync side of things would you is that how you would describe it yes i would say that the way that sync agents should work 
And the way that I work, <laughs> work. is as follows. <laughs> yes, because I'm going to talk about the way that some others work, and I don't think that they work right. But basically, the way that I think a sync agent should work is that they're going to take a percentage of the upfront fee. Because we have two types of fees in a sync. We have an upfront fee, and then we have the royalties. As a sync agent, I should be doing a good enough job that I'm not taking points off of your back end. Right. You know, I'm not taking royalties. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a percentage of, let's say that the master and publishing all together come out to $10,000. I should be taking somewhere, and this is what I take depending on the client and the deal, mm -hmm between 20% and 33%. 33% is my top level. And I don't make anything outside of that. So if it's $10,000, I'm getting 3,300. Mm -hmm. If it's a smaller artist, if it's a big label, it's probably more like 20%, 25%. Yeah. It's yeah. usually 20 to 25% for that. Cool. And then the rest of that money goes to my client. Yeah. Um, we don't touch the royalties, because my philosophy on this is that I didn't write the music, I didn't make the music, I did the deal. So yeah. I get paid for the deal. I don't get paid for what happens afterwards. Um, now, there have been some instances where I did pay for the production or I helped in some way in the production. And then that's a different thing. Then yeah. we work something. Then out. you are a partner. In, you are an owner of some of the 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 of the song you're a part you're an owner right. of some of the master and or i i cut people in partners in all the time who contribute to the song yeah even in royalties i, I cut them in sometimes so uh, yeah and that's a different scenario yeah 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 uh, but there but you do have to watch out for a couple of things i'll say to you as if you're looking for a sync agent the first thing you should do is you should just look around a little bit about what they've done mm -hmm. research them See if the kinds of music they represent work with the kinds of music that you represent, that you make. The other thing that you need to know, and this is really important, is that any good sync agent is not going to ask you for anything more than 50% of the upfront fee. Okay. I think that 20% 20, 20 to a third is better. Mm -hmm. I think that that's fair because the majority should go to you, mm -hmm. but 50% is acceptable because, you know, if they get you an opportunity and you make that decision, I think that's fair. But there are some people out there who will take 75% or take, just run. It, usually there's, <laughs> there's a lot of bad going on there. And then the other thing is I see people who put into their agreements that they will not only take half of the upfront fee, but they will also take your publishing share and make themselves your publisher, which I think is a bit nefarious. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I don't like it and I don't do it. And the music supervisors that I work with on my courses and listening sessions, we pretty much unanimously agree that this is not the way that people should work. Yeah. So if somebody comes to you with a deal like that, you should run. Another thing is, Non-exclusive versus exclusive, and I'm sure that uh, yeah. Tamara has a different. She has a different take than me, but uh, I just uh, I, I feel pretty strongly about non-exclusive. And when I'll you say non-exclusive, you mean as the seek agent, they can pitch through you, but they can pitch other places too if they want to. The same songs. exactly, they can pitch themselves. They can find other sync agents to work with. Mm -hmm. The reason that some sync agents say that they want you to be exclusive or being exclusive is good is that they say that music supervisors hate getting music from multiple sources well, i've heard well, this very thing in the past week from blah 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 it's blah 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 <laughs> because, i was just on a panel yeah i was just on a panel yesterday with one of the top the person who's head of music for an entire television network and and another person and we all agreed we don't care we don't they just care. need the song none of us care we have had he said that it happened to him once yeah in his history as a guy who's been in this business for decades yeah it happened to me twice and it never happened to the other person mm -hmm. so 
this whole thing about being exclusive versus non exclusive so that the music supervisor feels better is it's false. Yeah. It's just false. I'll be, I'm going to be kind. I'll just say it's false. Yeah, um, because what again, we care about is that we're getting the music. You were talking about looking at it from the perspective of the music buyer, um, who is the music supervisor. They need the song. Yeah. They need the song. They're not like, you know, uh, trying to, well, uh, how many people are, they're not thinking all the things that we're thinking. They're just saying, my job today is to find a song for this use and I've got to have it. And so whether I go to the library or go direct to a person, I'll just do the best I can. And so it makes sense that they wouldn't care about exclusivity uh, or, or that, oh, are no. you sure this, uh, Mark, are you the only person who has this song? Because I don't want somebody else coming about. They don't care because they've got a job to it's do. It's never and been a question. It right. <laughs> it's never been a question. The question has been like, okay, you, you represent this. You can execute the deal. You know, I know you can because we know each other or it's the first time I'm working with you. So go through my vetting process. I go through the vetting process. That's the end of that. And then we're okay. That's what's important. But in terms of exclusivity versus non-exclusivity, okay, there's that portion of it. I work with some catalogs where two or three people I know um, are responsible for those catalogs as well. And um, in those situations, we talk to each other internally, uh, you know, between ourselves to decide who's going to take this deal so that the music supervisor doesn't have to worry about it. Gotcha. So that's one thing that I I think a lot of people do. But with that said, I want to flip this to why this is important to the artist. You do not want to be exclusive to one company unless they give you upfront money, mm-hmm. you know, like a traditional publisher or label. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is that none of us in the, in the sync agency business, none of us, know every single person or every single sector. Right. And if you want to get the maximum value out of your music, you've got to be strategic about working with several different companies and people. And the reason I say this is, look, some people I know are very focused on television and film. They're based in LA. They know all the music supervisors in TV and film and they can really work some magic for you there. Mm -hmm. Then there's people who are based in New York. I'm sort of pointing to myself, though I work with a lot of TV and film. Mm -hmm. I'm very connected to the ad community. Mm -hmm. I'm very connected to brands. And I can guarantee that I have a better network than in advertising than most of the sync agents who are not based in New York and haven't put in the time. Um, but you know, there are people who know other areas better than I do. There are people who certainly know the game industry better than I do. And then you have international markets, you know, you sign exclusively worldwide to somebody here in the U S what do they know about how things actually work in Europe or in Japan or in Korea? Maybe they're like me and work with a lot of international and happen to know how it works, but chances are they're focused on their market. So when you're doing deals, if you do non-exclusives, you're able to harness the strategic power of people in different markets, in different sectors, and use that to your advantage. So that's awesome. That's how it breaks down. This is all gold, man. This is gold right here coming from Mark. Um, The other thing I've got to ask, or my the people who watch my channel will be very angry with me, and that is artists versus composer producers who are not artists but and and they they do like i said i have to talk them into having a spotify you know as a i'm bad about it you know about really pushing the comp me as a artist that is a composer you know if, if you know a lot of great composers who are getting stuff in films they they really have a they probably have a deal where they're on spotify and people can find them um oh sure where do you fall with uh signing uh, someone who is not an artist, who is more of a composer slash producer, and maybe they have a lot of artists and or vocalists they work with and stuff. Do you work with people like that as well? Sometimes. I mean, small I, like percentage. To, I like, yeah, it's a small percentage. And I do have some people that I work with like that, but mostly I want to work with artists who are fully fledged artists. Yeah. You know, I really do. 
whether it's a band, whether it's a solo artist, whoever it is, I want to work with somebody who's fully fledged, engaged in their career, because I think that if you are going to be a full-time composer, I think that you have a different orientation. Yeah. And there are some, you know, there are some composers, to be fair. I work with some great composers who do television and film soundtracks, mm -hmm. and they've got a great business going there. But they also, you know, over time have gotten to know me. I've gotten to know them. And I said, you know, you could repurpose some of this stuff that isn't, behold, you know, beholden to one of your films or one of the TV shows that you work with. Mm -hmm. And we can repurpose it to go out there and see if we can get some syncs for it because yeah. it's really, really good stuff. And because of that, yes, I do work with some composers on sort of pieces of their existing music that really hasn't gone out there that'll never be on Spotify, but could be very useful for people in media. So yes, I, have I do have some people like that. I have a theory about this, and my theory is that it's not you that is not wanting to work with composers and stuff. It's your it's your buyers who are really looking like that music supervisor. I've heard people talk about this on your Sync Summits before. They love to mm -hmm. discover that new artist. It's almost like the new A and R of of the industry. Oh, for sure. They love to find that artist that nobody's found. This artist in Wisconsin who's just this killer indie artist. They barely put anything out, and I found this song and I put it in this show, and it's it's going crazy. I mean, we've seen that happen with lots of artists, Image and Heap, and all these people were, who have had like, you know, this this song breakout and it breaks out their career. So it's, to me, I think that's what sync agents and, and, and music supervisors themselves are looking for. Music libraries don't care because they're not, they're not yeah. finding those kind of diamonds in the rough there. But I think music supervisors really are trying to say, I need something really original. I want to find something that's really super interesting to me. And it comes down to their personal preference, just like it does yours. And you have, you are somewhat of a muse of an A and R director kind of person, you know, where you're, you're looking at this For talent sure. that comes to you and you're going, what do you have going on at Spotify? What do you have going on on YouTube? Are you, you know, are you doing stuff like that? And so that's, I, I, I and I, I preach this all the time to people. I'm like, if you want to be attractive to them, you probably need to have an artist a very strong artist side. And you, a lot of the libraries, even like Artlist and places like this, they're like artist-based. Everything is artist-based now, you know, on these libraries, you know, rather than look, and they're all 35 years old or younger, you know, <laughs> it's, it's the new music business basically. It's just the licensing side. It's true. And you know, the thing is, is that what we really want from people other than all the process and business stuff that I talked about, which is important, I'm not discounting that, is we want authenticity. Yeah. We want authenticity and we want good quality and we want to be surprised and delighted by the music. We want something <laughs> that's just really interesting and beautiful and fun, whether it's dark whether it's uplifting, whether it's anthemic, you know, whatever genre it is, mm -hmm. you know, we, in our business, we listen to every genre. We listen to every type of music. We listen to every emotion of music because that's our responsibility. We all have our, our likes, you know, things that we like more than others, but we listen to everything and we just want to hear good new music. And like you've said, yes, there's definitely an A and R um, component in what we do because we're looking for the gems out of all the people that we work with, and then we're acting as an advocate for that. So we're not just out there saying, "Hey, here's a playlist of some stuff that could work with something that you've uh, sent to me." But when we sign an artist or we sign a new label. We're excited usually about the reason that we've done that. Yeah. I don't like to just do deals for the sake of doing deals. Yeah. I, I have the luxury of not being able to do that. I've That's got great. more music than I more. <laughs> I've got enough music to deal with, not more music than I yeah. need. I've got enough music to keep me busy. Sure. So when I sign with somebody, there's got to be some kind of spark there that gets me excited yeah. so that I can take that excitement and that passion for that artist and bring it to the music supervision community. Now with that said, 
everybody can get excited about something, and this has happened many, many times, but they have to work with an entire group of people. And if for some reason the group just says, you know what, that's not really on brand at the ad side, mm -hmm. or, you know, it doesn't help tell the story as much as this one does, there's not a lot we can do. Yeah. They're just going to do what they do. So we can, we can act as the advocate for the music that we represent. And certainly, you know, I'm very passionate about anybody that we work with. And I think that if you're a sync agent, you really should have that passion yeah. because if you don't, why are you here? Right. You know, maybe you should be at a library. Maybe you should be an accountant. I don't know. And what you just said is what I've heard every A&R person ever say is that I have to, I have to fall in love with something because I got to take this up the ladder to the rest of the A&R department, to the label uh, yep. president, and I have to sell it to them as well. So I, I better love it. I better be hysterically crazy about it. And I yes. don't think that's what most people understand because if I'm not, they're not going to be if I can't sell it. So uh, all that said, if uh, an artist happens to be watching this or um, someone is watching this, uh, how do you, is, is Discotic a company that people can just contact or do you have a specific, how do you go yeah, through that? Or is get, that in through touch with, get in touch with me and I like to start dialogues with people. I'm not going to say, oh, just send me a disco link, though you can send me a disco <laughs> link, but you can email me at emmettdisconic.com okay. and I, Emmett, yeah, email me at emmettdisconic.com okay. and I will be happy to meet you and connect with you and learn more about you and your music and we can uh see if uh there's something that that we can do together and let's see and then i just want to give you a couple of other links because let's I talk need, about sync summit for a to... second too if you're I know. yeah let's do that so I, yeah, let's that's how I found you. I think um, I can't remember if I found you on YouTube or if I found you on Facebook, but more likely because you're very, very active still on Facebook. Uh, are you moving? Yeah. Are you? Is that still growing your Facebook following and group and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's unfortunate that Facebook is the default platform. You know? It is. <laughs> but, yeah, it is what it is. It's all we've unfortunately. You know, but we've got. We've got, you know, we've got a growing community uh, on Facebook of about 6,500 people. Wow. We've got a mailing list for our newsletter of about 14,000. Uh, we've got uh, Twitter presence for whatever that's worth, or <laughs> X presence of about yeah. 18,000. Wow. And our Instagram is pretty cool with about, uh, with about 4,000 people. And finally, on LinkedIn, we have something like 18,000. But awesome. I see LinkedIn and Twitter as not being as useful yeah. as Facebook and you know Instagram. People really get interactive there. They collaborate sure. with each other. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, you know what? I'm going to put the link here. I say everybody should join our Facebook group because we do some cool stuff Facebook there with Sing yeah. Summit. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, we have our little video thing that we do called the Sync Cafe now and again. But you can join that; it's free. And you know, I, I, I like basically what Sync Summit has become over the years, and especially since the pandemic, we've made it much more artist focused and community driven than mm -hmm. it was in the past. You know. Yeah. Before we were doing events, that was our main thing. And we did listening sessions. But once the pandemic came, we really made it an interactive artist centric forum yeah. where we've dedicated ourselves to providing straight, honest information about how this industry works, mm -hmm. answering yeah. questions, helping people to connect. And we do all of this stuff completely for free. Now we have another side of what we do that costs money. And yeah, I, sure. I, you know, and you don't even have to touch that to get a lot of sure. uh, information. Right. But we have events that we do. Uh, we have two courses. Uh, one that I do with a music supervisor called Chris Moler, who uh, did Roswell, Pretty Little Diary, Pretty Little Liars, a whole bunch of stuff. Vampire Diaries, lots and lots of different If things. I'm not mistaken, my first library that I got signed to was a person who was at a Sync Summit. This was back when you were doing live stuff because this was 2020. 
Oh yeah. Or before 2020. And I was watching some before replay 2020, yeah. of a, of a sync summit live thing. And he was, he, he wasn't even on a panel. He was just shouted out and I looked him up and I looked up his library and now I'm, I'm like, I just delivered an album, another album last week. And so there, and, and I've, I'm doing stuff all the time for him. And it, I think it directly That's came right. from you. So, uh, I have that you to thank for that, uh, to, as far as, I mean, well, thank you. you know, you, you do I'm the, glad to, I love hearing about stuff like that. <laughs> You got to well, and that's the beauty of your community because so many people can learn so much. And you, like you said, it's free. And I believe a lot in free information. I mean, there's paid information. If you develop a course for people to teach them how to do something, they should pay for it. I'm a teacher as well. So, uh, you know, yeah. I wouldn't go teach all day long if I wasn't paid. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a service that we're doing for folks. So, well, man, anything exactly. else you want to say? Yeah, I'll put all these links in the description below. He's given me all sorts of great links here about the events and about listening sessions. And you guys should go and listen to all those. You know, one of the things that is on my list is to make more personal relationships. And I don't think you make relationships any better than uh, paying 75 bucks to sit in a, se in a session and show someone your song. It's actually great. I mean, seriously, it's like, I, I love the listening sessions because it's like, it's 75 bucks. So it's not going to break the bank. Right. Yeah, right. And you know, like this Sunday, I've got Josh Rabinowitz coming in with me. Josh, he has created and or licensed over 10,000 songs for major brands and uh, ads over the last 20 something years. Uh, he ran the music department at Young and Rubicam and Gray Advertising and now is on his own working with brands. That guy has an incredible wealth of knowledge and understanding. And the, his insights are worth something. But it, combined with that, connecting your music to somebody like that who could potentially change your life by using it, it's worth it. It's worth it for the network building yeah. and for the and for the intelligence. It's totally worth being a part of something like that. You can start a relationship that you can cultivate for years and send yeah. music to and all that kind of stuff for less than it would cost you to drive to Nashville or Los Angeles or or New York and go there and go to an actual and go knock on their door like I used to back in the 80s or 90s and knock on the door of the publisher and sit there and show my cassette of three songs. I could have yeah. just paid 75 I could pay 75 bucks to do that now, get feedback and get a relationship with someone who who can do that. So, I love them. I think they're yeah. great and I need to do more of them to be honest with you. So, well, man, thank you fun. so much for all of this information. This is just gold, all of it. And I hope everybody, I'm going to put this out on my YouTube channel and also my podcast so people can really soak all this up because there's a lot of mystery, I think, with some people with Seek Agents because I don't think there's oh, like, yeah. I don't think there's that many of you. There's not like there's thousands, right? I mean, this is there's a, a few hundred. There's, there's a few hundred. Okay. All right. You know, and, and it's really, Eric, I, I mean, I think that you brought up a great point, you know, is that people act like this business is alchemy like we're in some harry potter movie with a cauldron <laughs> and a huge spoon putting like newts and gold into a pot and having something come out of the other side yeah and you know it's not just it's not just you know people on the sync agent side, but music supervisors do this too. Mm -hmm. They make it like it's so mysterious. Yeah. It's, not mysterious. it's not mysterious. Everything is a process. Yeah. If you understand the process, then you can come out the other side with a real potential for success. And that is my mission when I'm working with artists is to take away that sort of like oh toil and trouble and gibble and bubble and whatever it is over there and really make it something that everybody can understand and be a part of. If you missed any part of this interview, go back to the part where he broke it down from each person who needs something and how they go about finding that thing in the real world, the real music supervisor looking for something. That's the gold stuff right there. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate thanks, you. Thanks, Eric. And uh, thanks for being on the channel. And I hope to talk to you soon.